Well, welcome. It's great to have you at New Hope Church on Easter Sunday. And just a side note, it's great to have you at New Hope Church on any Sunday, but we're really happy to have you here on Easter Sunday. Thank you for being here. If you are in a pew, those of you on the front row, I'm sorry, but if you're in a pew, in the back of the pew in front of you, there are some communication cards. And if you are a guest today, if you don't mind filling one out, dropping it in the offering bag when it comes by in a few moments, we promise we will not beat on your door. We're not going to call you on the phone, but through snail mail, all right? We're going to send you information that tells you about our church, about what we believe, about our staff, about our services, hopefully answer questions you might have, and, and we would love to have you come and visit us again. Those same cards are also for our regular church attenders and family. If you have messages to the staff, prayer requests, updates, uh, you want to meet with somebody on our team, fill them out, drop it in. Every Tuesday morning we meet, we go through every single card. So thank you for doing that. If you are a guest today, uh, on the piano in the back, uh, or on the pool table in the other room, all right, where we have overflow, uh, there is a book there uh, that says, we want you here. It's our gift to you. This is your first time here. We'd love you to pick up a copy of the book. It expresses uh, how much we would love to have you come back and spend time and spend life with us here at New Hope Church. Uh, we're not going to do many announcements today. In fact, I'm not doing any announcements today, but we are a church family, and there are still needs that uh, take place, and there are things that you need to know about and folks you need to pray for. So let me highlight a few of those. Few of those. David James, has spent all week at Cedar sinai Hospital. He had one surgery to remove hardware out of his back that wasn't working, and he had two or three more surgeries to put hardware back in that they hope will work. So please be praying for him. Um, Mike Rasmussen uh, is a friend of Tim Hertz, and he's been in the hospital, and uh, he, asked if, uh, he asked Tim if his pastor, Tim, would come visit him. And so uh, last weekend I visited with him, uh, he had some questions, we chatted about him. And by the end of the uh, discussion, he was ready to invite Christ in his life, make sure his life was right with the Lord. He went home from the hospital on Friday, and that is great news, and he may be in one of our three services today. He said if he was able to walk, he would be here today. So uh, continue to pray for Mike Rasmussen's uh, recovery. My, uh, my cousin by marriage, David, is in the hospital. As you know, he's been battling... Um, tumor that was on the side of his neck and cancerous and he has been going through treatment and he has now been bedridden for the last two weeks and he is at Clovis Community Hospital still waiting for answers and direction from the doctor. So if you'd remember to pray for David, they would appreciate that so much. Tom Briska. Some of you know Tom, but Tom will be the tallest guy on the back row. Big guy. He looks really smart because he went to Stanford, okay? <laughs> and um, uh, anyway, Tom's mom, uh, we requested prayer last Sunday for her. She was in ICU at Clovis Community Hospital. Uh, she was in her late 80s. She uh, knows the Lord, loves the Lord. And the decision was made on Wednesday of this week that the only thing from a human perspective that was keeping her life functional was the equipment. And the family determined that that was enough. And uh, it was a great decision. Mom was very peaceful. Mom was ready. And uh, not long after all the equipment was turned off, she went to be with Jesus. So be praying for uh, the Riska family. Some of them are here today. Tom's still singing in the choir today. And uh, his mom was very proud of that. Her services are going to be here Thursday at 11 o'clock. Uh, Teresa Hutchinson, not Grandma Teresa, who was in the choir, but college-age Teresa Hutchinson. Um, she works at uh, Wild Water Adventure, and it must have been some adventure Friday afternoon because she fell, broke her femur, and her collarbone. That kind of limits the crutches you can use, all right, for a while. So it's going to be tough going. She's supposed to be released from the hospital today. They did have to insert a rod in her femur. And um, so just be praying for her recovery at this particular time. And then the first part of this last week on Monday, we had the memorial service for Danny Heinz. So do remember there, his daughter is our neighbor, so do remember to pray for the Heinz family. I know they would appreciate that very much. At this time, we're going to ask our ushers to prepare to wait on us as we have our morning tithes and offering. And while we are receiving our offering this morning, our 2019 Easter choir and band is going to assemble on stage. And as soon as they are ready, we are going to begin our Easter musical presentation. Would you join with me as we pray? Our Father in heaven, it's a joy to have a personal relationship with you. And because you've made that possible for us, this day is the best of all days in the adventure of a year. The opportunity to celebrate 
the victorious answers to life's problems that Jesus Christ took care of when he was raised from the dead. No longer does death have the last word. No longer does guilt and condemnation and bitterness and frustration and failure and uh, all the other things that selfishness and sin does to us, no longer does it have to rule our day or rule our eternity. So thank you for what this day means to us. Thank you for the opportunity to celebrate and honor you with the best that we have and then to share with others what the best you have means to us. We pray for our choir. They were magnificent in the last service. We pray for their strength and their stamina. And may they just continue to share this wonderful message with us today. For the privilege of giving and sharing, we say thank you. In the incredible name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. I don't know what your story is. In fact, if we had the time to uh, allow a few of the folks in this choir to share their story, you would be shocked. The gentleman that uh, led you in the last song, he's my twin brother, his name is Tim. (laughs) And uh, Tim found his way to rewrite his story in Folsom Prison. There are others that could tell you their stories of having to go through drugs and alcohol and through Celebrate Recovery, they found a new story writer for their life. All of us have old stories, and sometimes those old stories aren't bad, but they're not near as good as the new story that Jesus would like to write for each and every one of us. So today we're going to look a little bit at the story of Easter and see if maybe there might be some encouragement in our own lives to allow Jesus to begin to write a new story in the chapters of our book. On the southern border of the empire of Cyrus, there lived a great chieftain named Cagular, and he tore to shreds and completely defeated the various detachments of Cyrus' army that was sent to subdue him. Finally, the emperor, amassing his entire army, marched down and surrounded and overwhelmed Cagular's forces. They captured him and captured his wife, And they took him back to the capital city for execution. On the scheduled day for their execution, he and his wife were brought to the judgment chamber. Cagular was a fine-looking man. He was well over six feet tall. He had this noble manner about him. It was written that he was a magnificent specimen of a man. Look at this and think the opposite. That would have been Cagular. So impressed was Cyrus with his appearance that he said to Cagular, what would you do if I spared your life? Your majesty, if you spared my life, I would return to my home and I would remain your obedient servant until the day I die. Cagular, what would you do if I spared the life of your wife? Your majesty, If you spared the life of my wife, I would die for you. So moved was the emperor by Cagular's words and attitude that he freed them both and he returned Cagular to his homeland to serve as governor. Upon arriving home, Cagular reminisced about the trip with his wife. And he said, darling, did did you notice the marble entrance at at the opening of the palace? Did you see the tapestry on the walls as we went down the corridor into the throne room? Did you see the throne on which the emperor sat? It must have been carved from pure gold. His wife replied, I really don't remember any of that, Cagular. Well, said Cagular in amazement, what do you remember? His wife looked at him and said, I remember only the face of the man who said, He would die for me. That is a love that passes understanding. Today, we are going to talk about a man who not only would die for us, but would break the power of death for us so that he could bring eternal life to us. That is what the Easter story is all about. Let's review just briefly some of the events of this past week. Last Sunday was Palm Sunday. It's the day that we recognize Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, heading into the last week of his life. It was a rather spectacular day. They threw a big parade. It's probably kind of like the Clovis Rodeo Parade, all right? Big celebration. 
His arrival was such a big celebration by the people that it caused the Pharisees, the religious leaders of Jerusalem, to be jealous. And they said, look how the whole world has gone after him. And for the next few days, these religious leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians, the chief priests, they tried again and again to trap Jesus with trick questions in an effort to turn the affection of the people against him. But they failed miserably. You see, Jesus has a way of upsetting religion. And religion has a way of being upset with Jesus. If you came today because somebody's in the choir and otherwise you can't stand to go to church, thank you for being so nice. Maybe you don't like religion. You're in good company. I don't like it either. Religion has not been good for humanity. Jesus didn't come to make any of us religious. He didn't want to make us Jewish. He didn't want to make us Catholic. He didn't want to make us a Baptist or a Presbyterian or a Methodist. Jesus wanted to come have a relationship with you, with me, like I have with Shelley and my sons and my daughter and my best friends. Jesus wants a relationship by choice, by what he did here. He's proposed to you and me to enter into a committed relationship with him. He's just waiting for you and I to say yes. Some of the other events during this past week, some of the people wanted to crown Jesus as a literal political king. Then Jesus shows up at the temple and really makes religious folks mad because he cleanses the temple. He purifies it from its filth. We then find Jesus on his knees washing disciples' feet and then we see him offering them the Lord's Supper and explaining that the Passover was the old but the Lord's Supper is the new and the transition between the two. And after the meal, he went into the Garden of Gethsemane with the disciples and there he prayed. It is there where Judas, with a kiss, betrayed him. It is there that with that betrayal kiss, the temple guards arrested Jesus For the rest of that night, Jesus had to endure the scorn and the abuse that was heaped upon him through illegal nighttime trials before the Jewish Sanhedrin. The witnesses that night couldn't get their lies straight. That's a problem with a lie. It's tough to keep them all straight. But the priests were so filled with hatred towards Jesus that their verdict was a a, a preconceived conclusion Since only Roman authorities could order the death penalty, just as soon as daybreak took place, they took Jesus to the Roman governor, Pilate, accusing Jesus of sedition and inciting a rebellion. All of that is familiar to most of us if we've ever been to an Easter service. This morning, what I want to focus for just a few minutes on is a scene out of Luke's Gospel, chapter 23, verses 13 through 24. You're welcome to turn there, or you can just sit back and listen. Here is what the doctor wrote in Luke 23, 13 through 24. Pilate called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people, and he said to them, you brought this man to me as one who was inciting the people to rebellion. I have examined him in your presence, and I have found no basis of your charge against him. Neither has Herod, and he sent him back to us, as you can see. He has done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I will punish him, and I will release him. And with one voice, the Pharisees and the Sadducees cried out, Away with this man! Release Barabbas to us! Barabbas was an insurrectionist and a murderer waiting for his own execution. And they said, Give us Barabbas. You crucify Jesus. For the third time, Pilate spoke to them. Why? What crime has this man committed? He upset religion. That was his crime. I have found in him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore, I will have him punished, and then I will release him. But with loud shouts and with great insistence, they demanded Jesus be crucified, and their shouts prevailed. So Pilate, a typical politician, decided to grant the people's demand. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, the one they asked for. And they surrendered Jesus to the will of the people. A poet once wrote, of all the words of tongue and pen, the saddest of these, it might have been. If that is true, then one of the most tragic words in the human language must be the word almost. 
almost speaks of aborted opportunities and missed chances. I'm sure that as long as the world exists, almost will dot the pages of human history. I almost climbed that mountain. I almost reached that goal. I almost closed the deal. I almost got there on time. I almost was successful. We've all had a list of almost experiences, haven't we? I suppose that the most famous or maybe infamous would be a better word, almoster in history. I'm not sure you'll find that if you Google almoster. It might not show up, okay? But the most infamous almoster might be Pilate. He almost released Jesus. Now understand something. If Pilate had released Jesus, Jesus was still going to be crucified. That's what Jesus came to do, was to die on a cross for your sin and mine. He came to be the lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world. But it didn't have to be Pilate who did it. He could have put it right back on the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But Pilate almost let Jesus go. And he has to live with that. He had to live with that for the rest of his life. What a change there would have been in our perception of Pilate in the Easter story, wouldn't there be? Why, we might be calling him Saint Pilate today if he had actually set Jesus free. But he didn't. He could have. And that's the tragedy. He could have, but he didn't. Do you have a could have but didn't moment in your life that could end up very tragically? Pilate had the authority to make this change. He, he wore the signet ring of government and power. All he had to do was speak the word decisively and Jesus would have been set free almost. Verse 23 says, but with loud shouts, the people insisted and demanded he be crucified and they prevailed. Pilate granted their demands. Pilate listened to their voices. We could even say, I suppose, he listened to the voice of evil. You and I probably won't admit it, but we've heard such voices, haven't we? We've heard that voice that said, go on, cheat. Cheat on your test. Nobody will know. Cheat on your taxes. Oh, you might have just done that. I'm sorry. Cheat on your spouse. You see, we hear those voices to cheat, to take shortcuts. Nobody will know. Nobody will find out. Guess what? God always knows. And when he's ready, somebody finds out. Almost leads to a bad end result. You see, Satan invites us into paths that we should not go usually shortcuts that end up finding us lost. But Pilate didn't have to listen to those voices. There were other voices clamoring for his attention. I'm sorry, man, I hate to bring this up, but it's in the scriptures. In the Gospel of Matthew, it gives us a little more of the story than Luke does in his Gospel, a little bit more about Pilate as he deliberates and makes this almost decision. You see, Pilate could have listened to his wife. Some of you men have almost done that, haven't you? <laughs> Listen to what it says in Matthew 27, 19. His wife sent Pilate a note. And the note said, Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. Don't do it. He could have listened to his wife. But he didn't. Ladies, you can quote me on that for the next week, okay? It's not good. There's no pass after a week, okay? I don't want to put up with this the rest of the year, all right? So just, just for a week. Pilate also could have listened to his own voice. For Pilate was not stupid. Pilate was not a foolish, crazy man. He knew that, that, that Anus and Caiaphas, the chief priests, that they were corrupt and greedy. He knew that they were lying about Jesus he could have listened to that own voice of reason and common sense. He almost did, but he didn't. Pilate's not the only one who's played that game of almost, is he? 
You and I have played it too. Pastor, I almost made a decision for Jesus when I was, uh, when I was in high school. But I didn't. Pastor, last Easter when I was at church, I almost prayed that prayer with you. But I didn't. You see, you and I have other voices we can listen to. We can listen to the voice of Christ and invite him into our life. The Bible very clear, clearly teaches us there are no almosts in heaven. There's no almost about a relationship with Jesus. It is either heaven or hell. It is either Christ or self. And we should not allow Pilate's tragedy to become our tragedy. As we continue reading in the story of the Easter week, we find Jesus nailed to a cross, crucified. You see, when Pilate let him go, he took him to the soldiers. Soldiers were doing what they were paid to do. They had crucified many before Jesus. Jesus was just another in a list. They took him and those two that were hung, one on each side of him, and they took him out to the hill. They laid a piece of wood down for each of them and told them to lay down on it. And the hardest part of crucifying a person is the first hand. But with Jesus, there was no resistance. He just spread them. They'd never seen a man do that before. They nailed him. They then stood up the pole and then they rammed that post into a hole in the ground that had held crosses before. And more than likely, they took supports from the ground up a ways on the cross and nailed those in place so that cross would stay in position until the criminal died. And then these group of soldiers who were doing what they'd always done before, they found one of them had carried the garment of Jesus out to Calvary's cross. It was untorn, fulfilling prophecy that were hundreds of years old. And the guy said, hey, this is a good garment. I'll flip you for it. They didn't flip coins in. They cast lots. I'll gamble you for it. And they gambled for the clothing of Jesus there at the cross. And do you know what those at the foot of the cross who nailed him to it, who after he was hung there for hours, heard them gambling for his clothing? Do you know what Jesus said? Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They don't understand what's going on. Father, forgive them. My disciples who have all run from me and betrayed me, a few of them are sitting out there on the outskirts. Oh, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Father, forgive the one who drove the nail in my wrist. Father, forgive the one who gambled for my garments. Father, forgive the one who betrayed me three times before the rooster crowed. Father, forgive Anus and Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin for all of their lies. Father, would you please forgive a group of folks who on the third Sunday of April in 2019 will gather in a country-looking church. Forgive them for their sins that put me on this cross. Have you heard his words? I suspect some of those were so close to the cross they could have heard those words, but they didn't. So close, yet so far away. I don't know if you or I could ever pray the kind of prayer that Jesus prayed. We have a tough time for, for forgiving each other. We have a tough time forgiving members of our family. We have a tough time forgiving members of our church family. And yet Jesus gives the example. And he says, once we have become the recipients of his great forgiveness, now we ought to forgive one another. The gospel tells us that Jesus spoke seven times on the cross. Three times before the darkness came. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Then he responded to one of the thieves, today you'll be with me in paradise. 
And then he looked at Mary, his mother, and John the apostle. He said, dear woman, here is your son. And to his disciple John, he said, son, here is your mother. And all of a sudden, as soon as he finished those first three of his seven statements, the sky went dark and black. Lightning and thunder rolled across the sky and the ground began to shake. And then when the storm was at its height, when the the world was its darkest, Jesus cried out that short saying that none of us can pronounce, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, la Those who stood in the distance could barely hear those words. Some said maybe he's calling for Elijah. Let's see if Elijah shows up. I want to know which one of them would have recognized Elijah when he showed up. He'd been dead a thousand years. But those who were closest heard him say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You've left me alone. At that moment, the sins of the world, your sins and mine, caused God the Father to depart from God the Son. And not only was the world dark, but the soul of Jesus was dark. Preacher buddy over at Mountain View today is preaching on something I've never heard preached about on Easter He's preaching about the last two plagues and comparing it to Easter morning. The ninth plague was darkness. And the tenth plague, for any household that had not put the blood of a newborn lamb on the posts above and on each side of the door, that night the death angel would cross over and would take the firstborn son in every family. Darkness, death of the firstborn. Darkness for three hours. Death of the only son. Wow. But what comes next? For Israel after the tenth plague, freedom from captivity on their way to a land of promise. What happens after crucifixion and death? resurrection and life. And Jesus said, I've come to give you life and life more abundant. It's not only forgiveness of our sins so we can have a home in heaven, but it is the personal life of Jesus Christ in the person of the Holy Spirit coming to live within us to do for us what we could never ever do for ourselves. Then the darkness left. And three more cries came from the lips of Jesus. I thirst. It is finished. And Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. You see, the cross didn't kill him and our sins didn't crush him. He gave his life. Not another man on that hill died at that moment. In fact, they had to come later and break the bones and the legs of the others that were crucified because they wanted them all down by that night because of a special Sabbath the next day. And when they came to Jesus, they discovered they didn't need to break his bones because he was already dead. He gave his life. Nobody took it from him. He did that for you and me. Let me wrap this up. There's probably nothing more consistent about life than its inconsistencies. But the message of Calvary has a consistent answer for our inconsistent living The world says life is like a tossed salad. You stick in your fork, you never know for sure what you're going to get. The world says life like a roller coaster. It's got twists and turns and ups and downs, and you never really know what's going to happen next, and that's so true with life. But if there is one very strong message that comes to us from Calvary, it is that God is able to take all the inconsistencies, all of our failures, all of our frustrations, all, all, all of our embarrassments, and he's willing to piece our life together and weave them into a beautiful tapestry. That is the message of a new story being written for you and me. Oh, I know one day the sun shines and the next it rains. One day we think everything's going our way and the the next our world comes crashing around us. One moment we're young and healthy and the next you're this. Jesus is saying it really doesn't matter because all of you who've really committed yourselves to me, you can find righteousness and goodness and victory, not defeat. You'll find that your despair is replaced with eternal hope because that is the message of Calvary. So in the light of all of that, I want to encourage some of you, don't leave here today almost believing. Don't leave here today almost persuaded. 
Don't leave away from here. Turn away and go on with life as usual. Why don't you pray a simple prayer? Use your own words. Jesus, I'm tired of running from you. Jesus, I'm trying to do it all by myself. Jesus, I, I am sorry that I'm a sinner. That's the hardest part for us Americans. We don't mind accepting God into our life, but we don't want to have to acknowledge I'm a sinful person. I don't know why you think you're any better than the rest of us. All of us are sinners. And what sinners means is not I've committed, committed vile acts. It means you've lived independent from God. You've tried to be your own God. That's what sin is, and sometimes it reflects itself in vile acts. Other times, you're just well-trained house pets. You've learned how to control your nature, and you know how to behave. Still a sinner in need of a Savior. Jesus came to take care of all of that at the cross. Several years ago, oh man, Chad was still playing baseball. We were down at a tournament in the desert. I was driving back. Everybody else was asleep in the car. It's Saturday before Easter Sunday. I'm not missing Easter. And I don't say that because I'm the pastor. I wouldn't miss Easter even if I wasn't the pastor. It's that big a deal to me. But I was still trying to put final touches on a sermon. And... Um, Everybody was asleep, and I was listening to some, I thought I had some, a Christian station on, and through the desert it sort of changed, and it went to country western, and next best thing to good Christian music is country western music. I mean, most country western music talk about lying, cheating people in need of love, all right? That's what most country western music is all about. But a song played, first time I ever heard it. You guys will recognize the writer in a few minutes. And that Sunday, if you were here, and this, is, this has got to be, hmm, this has got to be more than 15 years ago. It might be 20 years ago. I preached this sermon Easter Sunday morning. The Sunday morning message that day was, I love this bar. How many of you were here? Do you remember that one? All right. Ten of you. All right, Good. I've made a lot of people mad since then, obviously, and, and some, some of them that day, all right, some of them that day. But actually, actually what captured my attention in that song is, and if you don't know the words to it, let me, let me share the, the, the opening. We got winners, we got losers, we got chain smokers and boozers. We got yuppies and we got bikers and we got thirsty hitchhikers. And the girls next door dress up like movie stars. We got hustlers and we got fighters broken-hearted fools and suckers. We got cowboys and we got truckers. And the veterans talk about their battle scars. Oh, I love this bar. It's my kind of place. Just walking through the front door puts a big smile on my face. It ain't too far. Come as you are. I love this bar. I've seen short skirts and we've got high techs, blue collar boys and rednecks, and we got lovers and lots of lookers, and I've seen dancing girls and hookers, and we like to drink our beer from a mason jar. Oh, I love this bar. And it dawned on me as I listened to that song for the very first time, how come somebody hasn't written a song like that about the church? How come people don't say, I love this church and I smile when I walk through the doors? Because no matter what my past has been, whether I'm a redneck or a high tech, whether I'm a hooker or a looker, I can find the love of God here. I can find acceptance here. If you happen to be here and you are a judgmental Christian, it is time that you let grace write a new story in your life and you stop judging other people. And if you are here and you've never had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you need to forget judgmental Christians who have built a wall in front of you trying to keep you from almost finding Jesus. You see, I love this bar needs to be transformed to I love this Jesus. The church will never be perfect. The pastors who lead their churches, we will never be perfect. But the Jesus who hung on a cross died to perfect every single one of us. And it's time that you stop being an almost person who knows Jesus. It's time you invited him into your life. 
Because I can tell you, I can tell you, there's not a man or woman who sang in that choir who isn't so thrilled about the transformation that Jesus has done in their life. Some of them were really good people. Stanford grad, you got to be pretty. I'm talking about your daddy now, all right? There's some big grown sons who are sitting out there, all right? I got to be nice because they're a whole lot bigger than I am. That smart Stanford grad who played football and now can barely walk but made it to Africa and back. Why? Because there came a moment in his life when he let God rewrite his story. He wasn't too smart. He wasn't too athletic. He wasn't too good looking. He was a sinner who needed a savior. And so do you. So why don't you stop being an almoster and join with me in a closing prayer. Pray this yourself if it describes the place you are in right now. God, I may not have this all figured out, but I'm ready to have a relationship with you. I want to invite you in so that with your presence in me, you can explain to me the things I don't understand about the gospel. What I do understand about the gospel is it's absolutely correct. I am a sinner. I have bad thoughts. I have bad inclinations. I sometimes even have bad behavior. And if I say that I'm not, I am just trying to fool myself. And God, I'm tired of playing the comparison game. I'm better than so-and-so. I'm not quite as good as that. But, but where's the line that lets me know for sure I'm in and not out? God, you said there's not a line that says I'm good enough. There's a line that says only Jesus is good enough and everybody else is out. But you bridge that gap so that through you, the one who said I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, I can move from being out to being in by the way of Jesus Christ. So, Father, for the man or a woman, for the son or the daughter, for the young person, for the college student who, is, who has been an almost believer, may they become a genuine believer today. I'm not asking them to join this church. I'm not asking them to become religious, but I'm asking them to do business with you. I'm asking them to say yes to a Savior who on Calvary's Hill got on his knees and proposed his love for us. And may we say yes to that love today. Lord Jesus, thank you for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Happy Easter. Thanks for being here today. You can go.